Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Diving into the Power of Blue Foods as Medicine. I'm Leslie Samay, Director of Professional Development at Great Valley Publishing, and I'm the host for today's show. Before we get started, I have three points of housekeeping. First, in order to claim your credit, you'll have to remain with us through the entire hour-long presentation. Second, at the end of the session, our presenters will be taking questions. If you have a question, please use the comments box on the left-hand side of your screen to send your question over to us. We'll try to address as many questions as time allows. Finally, diving into the power of Blue Foods as Medicine awards one CPEU in, accord in accordance with the Commission on Dietetic Registration's CPEU Prior Approval Program. Food and Planet is a collective visionary 501c3 founded in 2020 by four registered dietitians. Their aim is to empower healthcare professionals to be leaders in sustainable food systems. They envision a science and practice of nutrition that honors nature as the foundation of health through the four dimensions of sustainability. Learn more at foodandplanet.org. Grant support for Food and Planet comes from the Builders Initiative Foundation, which invests in and collaborates with nonprofits, businesses, and others working towards sustainable solutions to societal and environmental challenges. Learn more at buildersinitiative.org. The faculty for this event have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. So let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers who are the co-founders of Food and Planet. Shereen Chu is Director of Community Engagement at Food and Planet. She's an award-winning dietitian and a chef who's focused on building a more equitable and sustainable food system through the intersection of plant-based nutrition, food, and social justice. Shereen has collaborated with national brands and institutions to build innovative programs that focuses on culinary nutrition and community empowerment. Kate Deegan serves as Director of Strategy at Food and Planet. In this role, and as an award-winning dietitian and media contributor, Kate collaborates with forward-thinking food companies, organizations, and investors to accelerate the transition to a more nutritious, equitable, and regenerative food future. Sharon Palmer is Director of Operations at Food and Planet. Known as the Plant-Powered Dietitian, Sharon has established an award-winning career in the field of plant-based nutrition and sustainability. As a widely recognized registered dietitian in the global community, Sharon is an accomplished writer, editor, blogger, author, speaker, professor, advisor, and media expert. Chris Bogliano serves as Director of Global Research at Food and Planet. He is also a Technical Advisor of Food Systems with the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, where he's currently working on adapting and implementing the first ever global diet quality monitoring system, the Diet Quality Questionnaire, in partnership with Harvard University and Gallup World Polls. And so with that, I'm pleased to turn it over now to the Food and Planet team. Welcome to Kate Geegan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie, and thanks to everyone joining today. We really appreciate your taking the time to be with us for this hour. So you'll see on this slide, here are the learning objectives, which you've all seen. So let's go ahead and dive in to what are blue foods. So this definition comes from the Blue Foods Assessment, and that's a landmark international collaboration representing expertise for more than 100 scientists and 25 institutions. The concept of blue foods refers to local foods produced from a diverse range of aquatic animals, plants, or algae, that are caught or cultivated in freshwater or marine environments. Now, these are foods that have long been enjoyed by many cultures as traditional foods and medicine, many of which are also a cornerstone of our global food system today. Did you actually know that seafood is the largest traded commodity, food commodity that is in the world? They also sit at the modern nexus of culinary innovation and sustainability. Another term for blue foods is aquatic foods. And as with terrestrial agriculture language, as you've probably seen, the concept of blue foods is an evolving space with different language and terminology that you may hear different individuals or even different organizations use. In our own experience at Food and Planet, for instance, we found that many of the global research and NGO community, as well as several individuals that we've just met in our work, prefer the nuance and inclusivity of the term aquatic foods instead of blue foods. What I personally appreciate about this definition of aquatic foods, and this comes from one of the blue food assessment papers, is that it offers a deeper dive into the many different types of foods that can be considered aquatic foods, as you'll see that list of seven different categories on the right. But here in the US, there are also adjacent terms such as blue carbon and blue economy 
So it's helpful to know there's no one right answer and context can certainly vary, but they are all essentially referring to the same concept. Now, I love this quote because to me, this frames the why. And it reads, discussions of the food system tend to center on agriculture and land, crops and livestock. That framing shunts blue foods to the margins. Game-changing opportunities are lost. A first step is to ensure that food issues are framed in terms that embrace the potential of blue foods, in terms of food production instead of agriculture, of lands and waters instead of lands, of fish and seaweed as well as livestock, livestock and crops. As I said earlier, seafood is the largest traded food commodity in the world. Our oceans cover 70% of our planet, and over 3 billion people depend on blue foods as a vital source of protein and other nutrients. So it's important they hold prominence in all of the conversations health professionals are having right now about how we can shift to more sustainable diets. So why do blue foods matter now? Well, for decades, blue foods have been largely overlooked or undervalued in global food system assessment, primarily for three reasons, and they're listed there on the right. Number one, much of the sustainable food system conversation and emphasis has focused on terrestrial agriculture and livestock. Secondly, very few federal appropriations, if you think about the Farm Bill, for instance, addresses support for sustainable fishing and aquaculture, and this can further exacerbate these disparities between the terrestrial and aquatic sectors. And then lastly, the topic of seafood has historically focused on relatively few species. And in those cases, we really emphasize energy and protein content, masking the rich diversity of species and micronutrients. So we're really in a moment where we have the opportunity to bring a more dynamic approach to this space. Why are blue foods gaining worldwide attention? There's three key reasons for this. Now, if you're starting to wonder why I'm focusing so much on a global lens, it's because, remember, 90% of the seafood we consume in the U.S. is imported. So considering global context is vital. Several global assessments have zeroed in on these three points, nutrient density, food equity and security, and sustainability as primary drivers of the opportunity around blue foods to transform food systems. Our other presenters today are gonna to be diving into each of these more deeply, but I wanted you to see the higher level framework which is driving interest in these foods. And that framework mirrors the lens we use here at Food and Planet. This is, we refer to this as the four dimensions of sustainable diets. It's really bringing a system thinking approach to our practice as health professionals. So we believe for, in order for diets to truly be sustainable, they have to embrace the four dimensions of sustainability, bringing sociocultural, planetary, nutrition, and economic considerations into how we show up with food recommendations and engage with the communities that we work in. So this is sort of a a summary of how blue foods fit into a sustainable diet framework. If we look just at a couple of bullets, sociocultural, for example, um, the second bullet, production can support indigenous small-scale local producers. And underneath that, blue foods versatility offers abundant opportunity to explore de delicious diverse flavors and culinary applications. From the economic dimension, if we look at the first bullet, many Americans already enjoy diverse options prepared in culturally appropriate, affordable formats. And sustainable practices can support long-term economic viability for producers and boost community resilience. So this framework can be really helpful for thinking through the complexity of sustainable diets and really just ensuring that you're thinking about all the factors rather than just one dimension and saying whether or not something is sustainable. So let's shift now to how these foods relate to food as medicine approach. While nutrition is incredibly complex, we do know a lot about the science of nutrition and disease prevention, of treatment and even reversal through a food as medicine approach. Many national organizations from the USDA to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the American College of Cancer Research and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine recognize nutrient dense foods, including blue foods can be a part of a first line of defense for chronic conditions such as diabetes, obesity, many types of cancer, heart disease, mental health conditions, and more. We're gonna take a brief look at that now, but I wanted to start with this Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics framework 
which provides, I think, a nice overview of the various ways we might use a food as medicine approach in our practice. So if we look at the four bullets on each of the um, images on the right, we see food as preventative medicine to encourage health and well-being, food as medicine to improve nutrition security, food as medicine to promote food safety, food as medicine and disease management and treatment. And we will consider all of these in this webinar. So our national dietary guidelines are a simple place to start. You'll see the titles are in quotes here, protein, healthy protein, and healthy sustainable protein. That's because they reflect the actual term used within each guideline itself. In the USDA dietary guidelines, blue foods are included in intake recommendations for every age group. And actually, they appear across three food groups. Dairy is actually a placeholder for calcium and vitamin D-rich foods. And if you click through on the dairy icon on the website of the USDA, and then you click on non-dairy sources of calcium, the USDA lists canned fish, such as sardines and salmon with bones, as nutrient-dense, healthy options. Seaweeds as well as li are listed as a vegetable. Moving on to the Harvard University Healthy Eating Plate, you'll see fish is the actual only animal protein that is encouraged as part of a healthy eating pattern. And in the most recent example on the right, the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation, Ample Fish and Nuts is one of the leading directives for choosing a healthy diet with an emphasis to choose from sustainably managed fish stocks. Several national health associations also have blue foods written into their healthy eating guidance because of the robust evidence base. For instance, eating fish twice a week is identified in the 2019 American Heart Association primary prevention recommendations. And this is based on evidence that eating fatty fish twice a week reduces the risk of dying from heart disease by 36% and slashes your risk of sudden cardiac death by 80 to 90%. Truly, that's food as medicine in action. Now, the American Diabetes Association and the American Psychiatric Association also pinpoint fatty fish as a food as medicine superstar. So how are we currently doing? When we zoom in on fish and seafood intake in the US dietary guidelines, on the right is the graphic representing an overall snapshot of seafood consumption for the US population age one and older. And you'll see that 90% of Americans fall short of that recommended twice a week guidance. On the left is the newest subgroup, age 12 to 23 months, which was just added in 2020. And this tells us seafood actually has the biggest gap between recommendations versus intake in any age category. It's a similar story in every subgroup, and you can see that if you look at the various 2020 dietary guideline charts of different age intakes. What this really tells us is we are not yet fully utilizing this blue food as medicine opportunity. If we look at the nutritional significance of blue foods, the picture becomes even clearer as to why they're such an important part of a food as medicine approach. This research comes from the blue food assessment, and what we're looking at here is an analysis published, published in Nature, which found that the top seven categories of nutrient-rich animal foods are actually all aquatic foods. Now, many of the papers and the positions that I've been talking about identify three key pathways for blue foods positive impact on the health, and they're listed on the right. Their ability to reduce micronutrient deficiencies, provide DHA and EPA, and displacing consumption of other animal proteins may all be part of the uh, synergistic effect of blue foods in the diet to drive positive health outcomes. So if you recall, pathways one and two were about closing nutrient gaps and delivering a source of essential omega-3 fatty acids. Here's an overview of the key nutrients blue foods offer and how they specifically address nutrient gaps across a variety of ages and populations. Vitamin D, for instance, on the right, we know is called out as a nutrient of concern in our dietary guidelines because most Americans currently fall short. Now, you're going to be hearing more about many of these nutrients from our other presenters, but on the far left column, I wanted to just draw your attention to the bottom left two examples of how inclusion of these foods and the essential fats they provide translate into a very real food as medicine approach, including IQ development in pregnancy and lactation and reductions in depression and anxiety. And finally, if you'll recall, the third key pathway research is identified was in regards to displacing consumption of other animal proteins. Just as with fats or carbs, 
the type of protein is very important when we bring a food as medicine lens to consider the nutrient package that come along with that choice and how that drives downstream health outcomes. So this study analyzed the association of changes in red meat consumption over eight years with mortality risk during the subsequent eight years using U.S. participant data from the well-known Nurses Health Study and the Health Professional Follow-Up Study. It found a 25% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality for swapping one serving a day of processed meat or fish and a 17% relative risk reduction when swapping red meat for fish. So I'm going to stop there. That concludes part one. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shireen Chow. Take it away, Shireen. Thank you so much, Kate. And I will kick off my section with two different polling questions that you'll see pop up on your screen. The first one is about bivalves. How often do you currently discuss bivalves, clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops with your clients? I'll give you a few moments for that. Okay, so most people, 66% say never um, or not applicable, uh, which Chris will address in his section. And then the second poll about sea vegetables and the same thing, how often do you currently discuss sea vegetables with your clients? Another moment for that as the results come in. Okay. So 71% uh, never or less than once per month. Great. So my section is all about sea vegetables, and when I had a chance to work on this project and talk more about sea vegetables, it's really, really excited because it's something that I grew up eating, all different types, and I'm excited to share the different things with you and the different types with you and some different amazing facts. So what exactly are sea vegetables? Uh, I call them seaweeds. Some people call them sea greens sea plants, greens from the sea, and they're all edible marine algae and plants that grow in or near the ocean as well as rivers and lakes. There are actually over 10,000 different types of seaweeds that exist, which I was amazed to learn that, and 96% of sea vegetables are cultivated today, and the common varieties, uh, they come in red, brown, and green. And you might think that sea vegetables or seaweeds are grown mostly in different parts of Asia, which they are, but there are actually several different areas in the U.S. that are producing sea vegetables in New England, Alaska, Washington, as well as California. And sea seaweeds don't require arable land or fresh water, and in most cases do not require fertilizer like land-based agriculture. So why are sea vegetables gaining worldwide attention? So they are incredibly nutrient dense. They're one of the most nutrient dense foods. They contain 23 essential nutrients, and I'll get into some of the micronutrients later on. Again, they're incredibly sustainable. Uh, when you look at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, they're rated as the best choice, uh, grown without fossil fuel-based agricultural inputs. And they also play a big role in food security, climate change mitigation, marine ecosystem restoration, and job creation. And in so many cultures, like mine, they are everyday foods um, in Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan, and then also in some coastal communities in Scotland, Iceland, and France. And if you've heard of the Blue Zones, uh, it is one of the staple ingredients in Okinawa. So what are some common varieties available in the United States? Well, you see here, there are several different kinds that are very available depending on where you live. Um, and you can also purchase them online or at different Asian grocery stores. And you might see them as condiments uh, in some American stores. 
The one you might be most familiar with would be nori. If you've had sushi or seen sushi before, that's typically uh, wrapped in nori. And then next to that is sea moss, or you might have seen some viral videos on TikTok about sea moss gel. That's becoming pretty popular. And then on the last one on the right, wakame, uh, you might see that if you've had miso soup in different restaurants or made it yourself, that is typically the most common sea vegetable used in that soup. And you can see that these are all different types that um, can either come rehydrated or dried. And some of the images are showing them rehydrated or dried, but the most common form you might find would be dried. So what is the sociocultural significance of sea vegetables? So again, they're part of big culinary traditions in different parts of Asia. About 66% of species continue to be used in everyday dishes. And I thought it was fascinating to learn that in Austria and Germany, seaweeds are actually composed of about 3% of this highly prized bread when you blend seaweed uh, and cereals together to make this bread. I've never had that before, but it sounds really great. And also, it's a, it's a part of honoring traditional knowledge. So last year, the governor of Hawaii named it the year of limu, and limu means seaweed. And he states that limu are an integral part of the traditional Hawaiian diet, are used for medicinal, religious, and cultural purposes. And expertise about limu has been largely transmitted largely among native Hawaiian women for generations. They also aid in food security for Alaska native tribal sovereignty due to its quick, quick growth and nutrient content. So what does the nutrition look like for sea vegetables? We've highlighted five different ones here. On the left, you can see dulse, kelp, kombu, nori, and wakame, and some of the micronutrients that are highlighted, either a good source or an excellent source. And you might be a little alarmed by how much iodine there is, and I'll address that a little bit later on. But you can see that there are several different micronutrients. How does it fit into different diet patterns? So in the USDA Dietary Guidelines for Americans, this current round, 2020 to 2025, they're actually called out in the guide, which I was surprised and also welcomed um, as part of the vegetable group. And in my culture and several others, uh, you might have seaweed or enjoy them every single day. And we're recommending that if it's something you're interested in trying, um, maybe you can recommend or try it one to two times per week, depending on whether you're using it as a side dish, condiment, or an ingredient to get started. There are also uh, these different diet patterns. I can see how they fit in. So they are compatible with almost all diet patterns and sometimes compatible with low sodium and renal. The micronutrients in sea vegetables, again, highlighting just a few of them. One of them, sodium. So sea vegetables are a great way to add saltiness and umami without drastically increasing sodium levels. And I used um, you know, a teaspoon of salt in comparison to a teaspoon of kelp flakes. And kelp flakes or different seaweed flakes, you might find them as little seaweed shakers uh, in different health food stores or furikake, which is a condiment. So kelp flakes, uh, one teaspoon contain about 5% daily value of sodium compared to one teaspoon, which is about 100%, depending on the type you get. So that's a big difference. And it also contains a good source of magnesium and potassium, which is typically found in these three different varieties, the wakame, kombu, as well as dulse. And iodine uh, is a great way to get iodine through the food source, which is seaweed. And adults mostly need uh, 150 micrograms per day. And pregnant people like me need about 250 micrograms per day. So what are some iodine impacts, which I shared that I would go into a little bit more. And this is based on the NIH iodine fact sheet. So they state that 
In most people, uh, iodine intake from food and supplements are unlikely to exceed the upper limit. In people who are at greater risk for iodine deficiency, people who do not use iodized salt. And so with the popularity of a lot of the fancy salts, like the pink salts um, or the sea salts, they actually don't contain iodine in most cases. Pregnant women have a higher RDA, people who follow a vegan diet, and those uh, who live in communities with iodine deficient soils, which uh, there isn't really a way to truly know that uh, based on the foods that we're buying. Um, and also people who eat foods high in goitrogens, soy, cassava, and cruciferous vegetables are also um, people who, have, who might have more iodine deficiency. So what are some culinary nutrition aspects to cooking with sea vegetables? And when I was doing research on this, I thought this was fascinating because I think when people think, okay, how come some cultures eat seaweed every single day or might have some with every meal, this made a lot more sense when I looked into the research. So seaweed um, is used to flavor a lot of dishes and soups and stocks before eating. And kombu, which is a type of seaweed, boiled in water for 15 minutes, actually loses 99% of its iodine content. So I thought that was a fascinating fact because that is how kombu is a lot, a lot of times used for stocks or soups. And processed kelp, uh, when it is processed, is boiled and dyed for about half an hour before hanging to dry. And that can also help reduce the seaweed iodine content before it's consumed. And in Asian cultures, uh, we commonly cook seaweed with different foods or eat seaweed with different foods that have goitrogens, broccoli, cabbage, bok choy, soy, and these phytochemicals can inhibit the iodine uptake. So with a high percentage of daily value of iodine, I think that these help combat those aspects. And again, um, it's a great sodium reducer in terms of enhancing flavor without adding more sodium to your diet. And I'll pass it over to Chris to talk more about bivalves. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Trent. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about bivalves, or what, what we refer to them as clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops. Um, the initial survey from this webinar indicates that the majority of folks on this call do not regularly promote bivalves within their practice, and hopefully by the end of this webinar, you will be more inspired to do so. So bivalves are a class of um, aquatic foods. Uh, they're actually quite ancient creatures. They're one of the oldest groups of animals on the earth. Um, there's actually fossil records showing that bivalves have dated back um, over 500 million years, meaning they've been around for quite some time, um, even, even before the dinosaurs. Bivalves is a class of um, food, aquatic foods that includes clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops. Um, they are called bivalves because they have hinged shells, which are distinct from crustaceans. Uh, there are around 9,000 known species of bivalves. And with their abundance, there is a variety of colors, shapes, sizes that stretch across many cultures and food traditions, such as the green lip mussels. Um, I was, had the privilege to try actually in New Zealand, which is a staple food in the indigenous Maori diet. Uh, traditionally, they've been hand harvested for millennia and play a critical role in many global food traditions. However, today um, we are now producing bivalves uh, more sustainably through aquaculture, and producing bivalves through aquaculture can benefit the health of people and the planet, planet while providing uh, uh, support to coastal economies. I love this graph from NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, which is a, a government agency, U.S. government. Um, they have a plethora of resources uh, around aquatic foods on their website, but this infographic is an excellent summary of some of the benefits of oysters. For instance, a single adult oyster can filter 50 gallons of water every single day. Um, oysters also improve uh, the environmental um, quality, uh, including biodiversity and 
are a really great source of economic growth within coastal regions. So diving a bit deeper into how bivalves can help the environment, um, they serve as natural water filters, actively removing and improving, uh, removing um, nutrients from the water and improving water quality uh, by uh, digesting suspended solids. They actually play a very critical role in supporting biodiversity by creating habitats and shelter for a wide range of marine species through the formation of shellfish beds and reefs. Um, they also act as natural barriers so they can help mitigate coastal erosion by reducing the impact of wave energy. And they also contribute to carbon sequestration by incorporating carbon dioxide into their shells which aids um, towards the global climate goals, including UN SDG 14, uh, which is life below water. Bivalves are also incredibly nutrient dense. Um, they are chock full of protein and essential minerals, vitamins, omega-3 fatty acids, offering a convenient way for people to get seafood on their plates a couple of times per week for optimal health, as directed by the dietary guidelines for Americans. Um, it's no surprise that bivalves are at the foundation of many of the world's healthiest traditional diet patterns similar to sea vegetables, uh, such as the Okinawan diet and Mediterranean diet patterns. You'll see on the right here um, that the serving size recommendation from the dietary guidelines from Americans is around three ounces or, or 85 grams twice per week. Um, on the far right of this graph, you'll see that bivalves fit into many, if not most, dietary patterns with the exception of vegan diets. Um, though I will say so certain uh, vegan diets do include oysters. It really just depends on um, um, you know, who you're talking to, but I would say that the majority of vegan diets do not include oysters, but it is compatible with all of these other diet patterns. So um, very um, diverse. So if we take a deeper look into the nutrient composition of the more common bivalves that, that you may find in the supermarket, you can see the unique nutrient profiles um, here. Um, I will say that these graphs, it's probably hard to read, uh, these graphs are available in our free aquatic foods toolkit, which we'll share more information on at the end of this webinar. Uh, but you can see that, that uh, clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops are loaded with essential nutrients such as iodine, iron, potassium, They're, they have selenium, vitamin B12, zinc, um, in, in fact, some um, mussels have more iron and more protein per serve than beef. So it's really incredible how um, nutrient dense uh, and, and you know, incredibly diverse of nutrients that these, these um, bivalves have. So um, from a nutrient standpoint, they are rock stars. And there are a wide variety and a delicious world of bivalves to explore. Uh, these are just a few different varieties, but these are likely the, the more common ones you may come across in your supermarket aisle, um, from clams to mussels, uh, oysters, and scallops. I know I personally haven't tried all of these. I've only tried um, a, you know, three or four on this list, but I have been looking and continue to look for uh, different varieties and species to try. Um, and so far, I have not been disappointed. They all have their own unique flavors, tastes, um, and and come with their unique nutrient profiles as well. Bivalves also have um, considerable socio-cultural importance. Uh, they are at the, the foundation of many culinary traditions, regional specialties uh, like clam chowder, oyster po uh, po'boys, and steamed mussels not only offer delicious flavors, but serve as a cultural connect, uh, a cultural connection to different communities, specifically when people um, immigrate to new cultures. They're also uh, full of traditional knowledge handed down through generations, which plays a vital role in safeguarding cultural heritage and indigenous practices. And lastly, they offer an opportunity for tourism and the hospitality in industry, especially in coastal regions renowned for their seafood offerings. And so, um, we get a lot of questions around bivalves and food safety. Um, shellfish allergies are more common than bivalve allergies. I do want to mention that, that having an allergy to shellfish or fish does not necessarily mean one is allergic to bivalves. 
Um, bivalves, like any other seafood, can be affected by environmental contaminants like heavy metals. However, uh, you know, the U.S. has very uh, vigilant monitoring in place where producers must adhere to strict standards and meticulously track their harvests. For those that are harvesting bivalves independently or while collecting bivalves, it is crucial to look at local government reports for safety data um, to make sure that the bay that they're collecting from is uh, of high quality. Every once in a while, there'll, there'll be an environmental um, concern in a bay, and then the, the local governments will report on that and, and recommend not harvesting from, uh, from that bay. And lastly, from sustainability standpoint, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch ranks bivalves as the best choice for sustainability. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council certification verifies safe and sustainable practices, so um, keep a lookout for the ASC logo on the bivalves. Um, and lastly, Environmental Working Group considers mussels to be the best bet in oysters to be a good choice based on their nutrient and environmental safety profiles. Findings from our partner organization, uh, Food for Climate League, uh, found that consumer hesitations around taste and texture of bivalves can often be overcome by highlighting other qualities such as nutrition, health, uh, culinary exploration of flavors and cultures, as well as sustainability. So to meet people where they are and, and to introduce bivalves into, um, into folks' diets and on their plates, um, emphasize their nutrition benefits and, and recommend them in familiar formats. Make them easily accessible um, and, and making and meeting people where they are at. Bivalves offer a very easy to use protein source. As mentioned, they're nutritious and versatile. Bivalves offer a rich, meaty taste that provides a healthy protein option for various dishes like soups, noodle dishes, curries, and even pizza. There also can be an affordable protein source. Uh, I know when we think of oysters, oftentimes we think of fresh oysters with lemon and champagne, and, and they are kind of targeted at, to a more luxurious audience. But Honestly, canned and frozen clams and mussels provide a, an incredibly accessible and budget-friendly alternative for using um, these in meals and snacks, which counters the perception that fresh bivalves are exclusively for expensive, expensive or luxurious audiences. So um, try to think of the multitude of ways you can incorporate bivalves into your recommendations, whether it be fresh, canned, or frozen. Now I will pass it over to Sharon Palmer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. So I'm really excited to talk about the fun stuff, how to integrate these delicious, sustainable, nutritious foods into our practices and in the work we do with our clients and our communities. So first of all, I wanted to talk about some of the cultural uses of blue foods throughout history. These are important traditional foods that have been enjoyed by humans since the beginning of time. Starting with sea vegetables, there are many rich global food traditions. Many countries in Asia, as Shireen has mentioned, enjoy sea vegetables on a regular basis. Some traditional recipes include Japanese rice balls, which are pictured here in our beautiful Blue Foods as Medicine Cookbook, which we're going to be talking to you, uh, talking with you in a little bit about how you can access that. Uh, a, a wakame salad, Taiwanese braised kelp, Korean seaweed soup. These are very traditional recipes that are all featured in our Blue Foods as Medicine Cookbook. In European cultures, such as in Ireland, a seaweed chowder is enjoyed. In Britain, seaweed fritters are beloved. Nordic seaweed crisp bread, where we're, they're actually integrating seaweed into this bread, is a traditional dish as well. In countries in Latin America, you can see sea, group, sea grape salads and beverages made with sea moss, even uh, kelp salads in Chile. In North America, we have uh, kind of some new modern takes on how we're using sea vegetables, such as California rolls, sea lettuce soup, and seaweed snacks. And I love the indigenous traditions in North America involving uh, sea vegetables. One is a bull kelp chow chow, which is using kelp and other vegetables and into a fermented medley that includes spices. Also, the addition of kombu, which is kelp, into beans, which tenderizes the beans. And then a beautiful traditional dish that is salmon with berries and seaweed. 
We also have many cultural traditions relating to bivalves that really stretch back through history. For example, when you look at the Mediterranean, we see so many classic dishes Usually you see these, these traditions in locations where they're close to the sea, close to the coastal areas. So in the Mediterranean, you have these stand, steamed clam dishes, mussel pilaf, bouillabaisse, mussels with wine and garlic. And then in Asian countries, there are many bivalve recipes. Korean clam soup, a Filipino mussel soup, which is pictured here, another recipe from our cookbook. Thai steamed mussels with coconut curry and clams in black bean sauce. European traditions also exist that uh, celebrate bivalves. In Nordic countries, it's traditional to have smoked oysters on toast. In France, you might have mussels with frites. In Italy, of course, clam with pasta. In Spain, paella with mussels. In Africa, you can find many countries that are celebrating um, different forms of bivalves, like mussels in Morocco, a South African mussel pot, which is kind of a soupy pot, in Mozambique, a M M Maputo clams is a dish that's traditional. In North America, we think about our clam bakes and clam chowders, as well as raw oysters and oyster casseroles, which is traditional in the South over the holiday time. There are indigenous traditions in North America surrounding uh, bivalves for sure. It was a staple food. Um, these foods were typically consumed raw, but they were also dried so that they could be uh, available during the winter when food sources were, were low. And they would be steamed over a bed of hot stones covered with leaves. In Latin American countries, you can enjoy things like clams with garlic, red chili with mussels, and of course, sopa de pescado. So many beautiful dishes. So what about you when you're working with your clients and you would like to educate them about some easy ways to include uh, blue foods. Let's, let's start with sea vegetables. And I know Shireen talked a lot about some of her favorite suggestions, but I also wanted to mention some ideas like kombu, which is kelp. Uh, you have to soak this to rehydrate it, and then you can simmer and boil it. And then you can um, serve it with soups and stews and braises, sauces, and noodle dishes. Wakame is something you might have been more familiar with. It's in a typical seaweed salad. Hijaki, uh, hijiki and sea lettuce also, these, these types of sea vegetables need to be soaked to re be rehydrated in water, then drained. And then you can use it in a beautiful salad, a side dish, or you can even top a grain bowl with it. I think one of the easiest ways you can introduce sea vegetables is through kelp or dulse granules. So these are finely chopped dried uh, kelp or dulse. It comes in a shaker bottle. I've, I am able to find it in most of my uh, markets here in California where I live, and all you have to do is just sprinkle it on things. It really adds this nice sea umami flavor. It's delicious over popcorn, toast, in sandwiches, tacos, whatever you like. And then nori is another sea vegetable that we're a little more familiar with. Um, it's an ex excellent wrap. You can use it, of course, to wrap sushis and hand rolls, but also sandwiches, sandwiches, sandwich fillings. You can even crush it as a topping over salads or side dishes. And then sea moss, uh, which has this amazing ability to create a gel when it's soaked in water, is becoming more popular. It's delicious in smoothies or creamy desserts. And we have a recipe for a sea moss uh, smoothie in the cookbook as well. So what about preparing bivalves? This can be a stumbling block uh, for people. So this is an opportunity for us to help educate people how to pr prepare fresh in-shell bivalves, things like clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops. So here are your steps. They have to be refrigerated, and then they need to be inspected. You have to look for tight shells. If you see any that are partially open, on it, open you just tap them. And if they close, those are good. If they don't close, or if they have a slimy uh, texture or a little bit of an off smell, you can discard or compost those. Then you soak them in salted water. You clean the outer shells with a vegetable brush, rinse with water, and cook. Now, there is one point I want to stress, that while many traditional diets and coastal communities love raw bivalves, the FDA does suggest, in particular among high-risk individuals, that you should avoid these raw or undercooked bivalves for safety reasons. 
So one easy cooking solution, once you've done, uh, once you're done preparing those in shell bivalves, is to simply steam them. And on the right, you can see a picture from our cookbook of these beautiful steamed garlic clams. And this is a very simple method. You just a heat liquid in a pan. It could be broth with wine. It, it could have herbs and garlic and vegetables. You drop those bivalves in there, cover the lid, and cook just till the shells open up. No longer than that because they tend to get tough and chewy. Then you can take that, serve it with rice, pasta, put it in a super stew, or serve it with vegetables. Very delicious. So I wanted to share with you some messaging tips for Bluetooth foods. And this is really based on the consumer research that came out of FCL and the work that we've done at Food and Planet talking with dietitians and understanding what the opportunities are for your communities to really embrace these foods. So one thing that's really important is highlighting safety because 79% of eaters said that this was the most important thing for them. So now that you understand a little bit more about the safety and um, how, how you can help your, your clients make the best choices, this can be a really important uh, goal for you. The other thing is to showcase how they can be time-saving, culturally relevant, and just delicious in cooking, really to help people cross that, that barrier and understand how to use them in the kitchen. So on the right, uh, you'll see a photo from the cookbook of a super easy mango to tofu hand roll. And that's just an easy uh, filling that's just wrapped up with nori and handheld recipe, kid-friendly and delicious. So, Really sharing some of these accessible, approachable ideas is going to help. And then also, you can motivate them by comparing blue foods to land-based agriculture. Because of some of the research that you've seen here um, in the presentation, you'll see that swapping from some of these land-based foods to more blue foods can provide health, nutrition, and sustainability benefits. So really that image of swapping out can be something that your clients and your community can embrace. Another thing you can do is share nutrition and health messages about bivalves in specific. And the consumer research really revealed that bivalves is kind of a confusing term for consumers. They don't really understand it. So it's really better to just call them by their name, clams, mussels, oysters, and scallops. Uh, these are the most common uh, forms of bivalves. So, you know, just use those names so people know what you're talking about. The other thing that we found is that leading with protein and health benefits is very impactful. People resonate with that message to understand that these foods are rich in protein, 15 to 20 grams of protein per serving, that they have omega-3 fatty acids and this bounty of nutrients, whether it's zinc, selenium, B12, uh, iodine, uh, and the fact that they can become a serving of seafood for their twice a week seafood recommendation for the DGAs. So really helping them understand the health and nutrition benefits will resonate with your community. The same thing for sea vegetables. Um, we're trying to really encourage you to use sea vegetable because seaweed can, even though it's more commonly known, it can have a negative connotation, the term weed. So we're really uh, embracing the sea vegetable term. And also, again, trying to, to educate about the varieties so that people start understanding that there's so many delicious, nutritious sea vegetables out there, whether it's kelp, kelp nori, or dull, starting to use that terminology. Uh, also, uh, really acknowledging the nutrition benefits. 93% of dietitians viewed sea vegetables as nutrient-dense foods with untapped potential. That's 93%. So that means we have our work to do by educating consumers about how we can use these foods, how helpful they are, how, how much nutrition uh, power they have, 23 essential nutrients, as we mentioned, and a climate-friendly ingredient and a natural source of iodine. So I also wanted to... Um, share with you a, a, a video from our new Blue Foods as Medicine cookbook. And I, I'm going to let Leslie start that video, but the, the cookbook was created by uh, 20 dietitians uh, contributing beautiful traditional recipes and innovative recipes on Blue Foods. And we also have 10 videos that go along with the cookbook. So we're going to share one video um, from Michelle Jalen about making this delicious, easy wakame salad. So Leslie, go ahead and play that for us, please. 
Try this Japanese-inspired wakame salad using simple, nutritious ingredients. Find wakame or seaweed at your Asian grocery store. A highly nutritious sea vegetable prepared by soaking and rinsing. The dressing is made of rice vinegar, sugar, sesame oil, soy sauce, and sesame seeds. Whisk together and then add in your salad ingredients. Cucumbers, carrots, and edamame. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to hand it over to Kate, who's going to share our resources. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and I love that video. That makes me hungry for lunch. Um, so I'm going to share a Blue Foods as Medicine just some additional open access resources that you can use for your practice. And the, the goal here is really to empower health professionals, students, practitioners to use these resources, however, to drive forward positive change and in incorporating more Blue Foods into their diet. So I'm excited to say that this actually formally kicks off our brand new Blue Food as Medicine curriculum. And it is available, it just launched about an hour ago on our open access website, eataquaticfoods.org. So we are a nonprofit. This is open access resources. And we created four modules that we gave you a little bit of a teaser of today. Uh, through these four parts of the webinar. Uh, module one focuses on Blue Food Foundations, foundational concepts. Module two really does a deeper dive into sea vegetables and the power of sea vegetables from a Blue Food as Medicine lens. Module three unpacks bivalves a lot more deeply as well. And module four builds on what Sharon presented with easy ways, actionable ideas to integrate them into your practice, including across food service, community intervention, culinary. So this free interactive online curriculum is available to download starting today. And the goal really is to help health practitioners with dietitians, we're actually rolling out as well to MDs and RNs, to develop an action-oriented understanding of the definition, nutritional significance, in sustainability of blue foods with this emphasis on some of the species we might not be as familiar with, like bivalves and sea vegetables, and to explore how these foods can be powerful treatment for diet-related chronic disease prevention and longevity. And as I just said, just to reemphasize, we really are encouraging practitioners to use these curriculum resources in a variety of ways, whether it's to further their own professional learning journey, to empower their communities, to teach students, educate patients, or incorporate into presentations even. The other resource you'll find there is the Blue Food as Medicine Cookbook, and you've been looking at some delicious recipes throughout uh, the presentation today, plus the video that Sharon just shared. And this is 20 Healthy Delicious recipes really with a culinary medicine lens from 20 dietitians featuring a variety of cultural food ways um, and, and different food formats that you can enjoy these foods in that really look, again, bringing that lens of the four dimensions of sustainability, so an emphasis on recipes that are accessible, available, um, culturally inclusive, but also deliver on health. So please be sure to go check those out as well and use. And then lastly, we earlier this year launched our basic resource of aquatic food toolkits for nutrition and health professionals. So this will really lay out for you the foundational information around bivalves and sea vegetables, how to find them, where to, how to prepare them, easy ways to walk through with patients and clients, how to utilize them in a variety of formats to um, really incorporate in their own food as health journey, food as medicine journey. And um, those are available as well, downloadable on the website. Lastly, I did just want to mention coming up on Wednesday, October 18th at 1 p.m., we have partnered with Pogue Brown. We're really excited to launch this with the Culinary Nutrition Collaborative in celebration of National Seafood Month. So please join us for a webinar to learn all about aquatic foods. 
And it, this, this webinar is actually pending approval for one CEU by the Commission on Dietetic Registration. So you can sign up and you'll get that link when you get this deck. So with that, I want to say thank you. Please connect with us on social. Please visit us at foodandplanet.org. You can sign up to become part of our community so you won't miss anything. And, and most importantly, you can join us in participating in this conversation about how we evolve our profession to come together and promote a healthier world for people and a thriving planet. And with that, I will pass it back to Leslie for the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Chris, Sharon, and Shireen. That was awesome. We have a good amount of time for some questions, so let's jump right in. The first one is for you, Chris, and this was asked a bunch of times throughout the Q&A, um, you know, the, the box that's popping up for us. Is there a concern about heavy metals in sea vegetables? I know you touched on it briefly, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie, and thanks for the question. Um, you know, bivalve and sea vegetables do have the potential to accumulate different substances, including heavy metals, and um, within them. But in the United States, we have regulatory agencies, including the Food and Drug Administration and NOAA, that monitor and regulate um, the levels of heavy metals in bivalves um, and sea vegetables to ensure that they're safe for human consumption. Um, these agencies conduct regular testing of um, harvesting areas, and if there is any concern within any contaminant, including heavy metals, um, they will actually um, put harvest restrictions and or just close that area until it is deemed safe again. So um, if you have any concerns, I would definitely check with the FDA or NOAA. Um, and additionally, it's recommended to purchase these foods from reputable sources that follow uh, safety and regulatory guidelines. And, and in the toolkit, we have details on which certifications to look for when purchasing these foods. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. The next question is going to be for you, Shireen. Um, a handful of folks have asked about the accessibility of sea vegetables in landlocked regions. And sort of in that same vein, is dried seaweed or, or dry, you know, some of these um, dried options as just as good as fresh options? Thanks, Leslie. Uh, I think those are great questions. Uh, I'll answer the dried versus fresh one. Um, I personally prefer dried uh, for several different reasons. Uh, first of all, those are the most accessible ones uh, that you might typically find either online or at different uh, grocery stores, Asian grocery stores. And those you can keep in your pantry for months, months on end, uh, and you would only use a small amount. So that, that to me is the most usable form and also the most readily available form. And then the second question about landlocked areas, and I was doing some research about, um, I always go to, okay, is this available in Kansas, and then also is it accessible either at Walmart or Kroger or Ralph's? And um, in fact, uh, nori or even the furikake seasoning, which I like to say is like a everything bagel seasoning, but with seaweed, that's actually about two dollars and fifty cents you can order um, in Kansas City right now. So that is um, in, in different parts of. The U.S. and I don't know if you you know if it makes a difference. Probably if you're closer to a big box store, one of these bigger uh, stores, but you can definitely get them delivered to you online and at a very affordable price. And a lot of the different snacks are also EBT eligible as well. Thank you. Great, excellent. Patricia actually just asked about ordering them online, so I'm glad you touched on that. And so this will be our last question, and it's for you, Sharon. Is the nutrient availability of bivalves affected by cooking? Thanks, Leslie. Um, actually, there, there are some small changes that you could compare, would be comparable to how uh, you would see a difference in nutrition when you cook seafood, and that's mainly related to a loss of liquid when you cook it, so it's concentrated. So you're going to see just a concentration that you're not going to – well the nutritional analysis that we've looked at doesn't show any significant changes or losses 
in um, nutritional value uh, from cooking. Great. Perfect. And we've just reached the top of the hour, so your timing is great. I want to pause and just say thank you all again for joining us today. Your expertise and information on this topic is much appreciated, and we were so glad to host you today. And as we always do at this point, let's talk about what's coming up next. On Tuesday, October 3rd, from 2 to 3.30, join Val Schonberg and Dr. Courtney Gleason for an interactive, interprofessional webinar that will reach beyond the research, providing case studies and discussion to illustrate real-world challenges for female athletes. Read more and register for Menarche to Menopause, a team approach for treating female athletes with Red S across the lifespan at our webinars page, ce.todaysdietitian.com forward slash webinars. Your attendance certificates are now available to download. You can follow the instructions on the screen or refer to the final slide of the presentation handout for how to complete the evaluation and access your certificate. And the credit claiming email will be sent out within the next few hours. It in includes these instructions again. Presenta presentation handouts were emailed earlier this morning. If you didn't receive them or can't find them, the links to download the handouts as well as the Blue Foods Cookbook will also be included in the lower portion of the credit claiming email. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to the Food and Planet team, and I wish everyone a great rest of your day.